today we're going to talk about entropy, which is a concept that most of you are probably familiar with. You may have heard about it in movies, on TV, perhaps from other educational YouTube videos, or for some of you, perhaps even in class. Now, the reason that I wanted to make this video is that, at least in my own experience, oftentimes when entropy is discussed, a definition of the notion of entropy is given that seems to be more confusing than it is enlightening. And in particular, one question that I find is often uh, answered in a confusing way is, what does entropy actually measure? So what we're going to do today is to try to remedy that, and I'll give uh, a simple and clear definition of the notion of entropy. And as we'll see, what entropy measures is irreversibility. And we'll talk about, uh, in more, more precise terms, what that exactly means. Now, before we get into it, uh, I should mention that one of the reasons that it's difficult to find a simple definition of entropy out there is that there are actually a bunch of different notions that are all called entropy. For instance, there's thermodynamic entropy, there's information entropy, entanglement entropy, topological entropy, and many, many more. And some of these concepts are related to each other, others aren't really. So it, it causes a lot of confusion because lots of different things that are really different things are called by the same name. Now today, we're going to talk about thermodynamic entropy, and that's the one that's related to irreversibility, and we'll discuss this uh, first. And then after that, we'll talk about Boltzmann entropy, which is a, a definition of entropy that some of you may be familiar with. And uh, we'll discuss how that relates to the, the first definition of entropy in terms of irreversibility. Let's start by discussing the concept of irreversibility. Now, what I'm about to say is going to seem obvious to most of you, but bear with me, because this is really the central concept that will allow us to define thermodynamic entropy. So we're going to start with. Uh, a simple experiment. Here I have a pendulum. It's a mass at the end of a string. And uh, I'm just going to let the pendulum uh, oscillate back and forth. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the video backwards. So what we've noticed is that whether I play the video forwards or backwards, the motion really is the same. In fact, when I play the video backwards, the only way that you have to, to, to see that the video is indeed being played backwards is that the, the clock down here is running in reverse. Other than that, the motion is exactly the same. Now, now why is that? Well, the motion of a pendulum is dictated by Newton's second law, the famous F equal to ma. Here, F is the, the sum of forces acting on the pendulum, m is the mass of the pendulum, and a is the acceleration. Well, the point is that this law is a reversible law. If I take all of, the, all of the times and I replace them with their opposites, so I replace time with minus time, the force is the same uh, one direction or the other, and the acceleration is, is the same one direction or the other. So this uh, law of motion is perfectly reversible. Now let's discuss another example in which the law is not reversible. What we have here is a glass of hot water and a sugar cube. I'm going to put the sugar cube in, and with uh, the spoon, I'll, I'll help it dissolve. I'm just uh, mixing the, the water here. And what we observe is that the sugar cube breaks up and slowly dissolves into the water. Now, again, like last time, let's just reverse the video uh, in this experiment. What we're seeing in the reverse video is that as the spoon is mixing the water, the sugar is spontaneously reforming, which is a completely unrealistic thing to happen. And that's because dissolving the sugar cube is an irreversible transformation. To talk about this more precisely, let's first switch to a simpler model than the, the sugar cube dissolving in water. And let's talk about the ideal gas, which is a model for, for instance, the air in this room. Now, from a mathematical point of view, the state of an ideal gas is determined by four quantities, the pressure, the volume, the temperature, and the density. And what we'll be interested in here are transformations between different states. So let's say, for instance, uh, let's consider a, a state that I'll denote by A. That, that means that I'm considering a certain pressure, P, volume, temperature, and density. And I'm going to be considering some kind of a process that takes me from the state A 
to another state B that has its own pressure, volume, temperature, and density. Now, because of the discussion that we've, we've just seen, we know that there are certain states uh, that can be attained from other states reversibly or not. So for instance, uh, it may, there may be a, a pair of states A and B such that it is possible to get from A to B, but not back from B to A. So let's look at an example of this. What I have here is a balloon. Um, so it's a balloon filled with gas. If I let go of the end of the balloon, the gas will come out. And now if I play the video backwards, the reverse motion we see is motion that doesn't make any sense. Just by opening up the end of the balloon, it gets filled with air. So this transformation that I just did from gas in the balloon to gas out of the balloon is an irreversible transformation. Now we're going to define entropy to quantify this irreversibility. To do that, we need to consider all of the possible states at once. Because entropy is going to be defined as a function of the state of the gas. So it's a function that takes as an argument the pressure, volume, temperature, and density. Now, how do we define this function? Well, we define it from the irreversibility. Considering all possible pairs of states A and B, there are three different kinds of situations. Either it is possible to get from state A to state B, but not back from B to, e, from B to A. In that case, the entropy of state A is smaller than the entropy of state B. Or this pair of states may be such that I can get from B to A, but not back from A to B, in which case the entropy of A is larger than the entropy of B. Or a third situation, there may be a situation where uh, I can get from the state A to the state B and back from the state B to the state A, in which case the entropy of A will be equal to the entropy of B. Now it turns out that with these three rules and some uh, extra very uh, reasonable axioms, one can prove that the entropy is uniquely defined up to some uh, small triviality. And this was actually done in detail by two mathematical physicists, Elliot Lieb and Jakob Ingvason, uh, I'll put a link to the, their paper in the description for those of you who may be interested in details. So the long and short of this is that once I've specified which states are accessible from which other states, then I uniquely define a function that is called the thermodynamic entropy. So in this way, thermodynamic entropy is quantifying irreversibility. Okay, so thermodynamic entropy quantifies irreversibility. But those of you who are familiar with the notion of entropy will probably have seen this formula before that says that the entropy is equal to the Boltzmann constant times the log of W. What does this formula have to do with irreversibility? Well, to understand that, we first need to change the point of view. When we discuss thermodynamic entropy, uh, we discussed the ideal gas as depending of, on four parameters, the pressure, volume, temperature, and density. To get to a formula that looks like this, we need to change our point of view and instead consider the dynamics of the atoms and molecules that make up this ideal gas. But now, we're going to need to bring in irreversibility into this, and a question arises almost immediately. How is it possible that the dynamics of atoms and molecules uh, is irreversible? In fact, if we believe that the world is classical, then the dynamics of these atoms and molecules is dictated by Newton's second law, which we saw earlier, to be a reversible equation. So how can we get irreversibility out of a reversible equation? Now, first of all, let me mention that quantum mechanics is not going to help us, because yes, it is true that atoms and molecules actually behave the laws of quantum mechanics, but quantum mechanics can be formulated in a way that is just as reversible as Newton's second law. So that's not going to help us with the irreversibility. Instead, what I would like to discuss now is that the irreversibility of uh, a gas from the microscopic perspective comes from the fact that there are very, very many atoms and molecules in the gas. So let's now discuss how that can lead to irreversibility. To discuss how this is possible, let's do another experiment. So here I have two packs of cards that are uh, each pack is ordered. So these are all the spades ordered ace through king, and these are all the diamonds ordered ace through king. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give, uh, to shuffle these two backs together once, 
and I'm going to time myself while I do it. So let's start the timer, shuffle once, and time. So it took approximately three seconds to uh, shuffle these cards together. So let me write that down. It took me three seconds. And now, as we can see, the cards are no longer completely ordered, although uh, they're, not in a, they're not terribly disordered either. So in fact, this shuffle that I did is not an irreversible uh, it's, not, it's not irreversible because I can undo it. So let me undo this shuffle and time myself while I do that. Let me start the timer. So it's actually fairly easy to undo the shuffle because I just need to separate the red cards from the black. Go. Okay. And time. So it's taken me approximately 15 seconds. I'll write that down to bring my two packs into uh, their original order. Right, so the shuffle that I performed was not irreversible, because I could indeed undo it, but it took me a lot longer to undo it than it did to do it. But that's not the central point that I want to discuss today. What I would like to, to, to uh, so what it, I would like to discuss is illustrated by the following fact. Let me now add some extra cards onto each pack. So now, in one pack, I have all the diamonds and all the and all the the hearts, so all the red cards. And in the other pack, I have all the spades and all the clubs, and they're all ordered ace through king, ace through king. Now I have twice as many cards as I had before. So let's redo the same experiment. I'm going to give these packs a shuffle, and time myself as I do it. So let's start the timer. Shuffle. Okay, the time that it took to shuffle the 52 cards is again approximately three seconds. And so now we see the cards are shuffled. And now let me do the sorting procedure again. So let's again time that. I'll start the timer. And here again I'm separating out the black cards from the reds. Okay, and time, now we see it took me approximately 35 seconds to uh, undo the shuffle. So what we see here, so these are the final numbers that I have. Uh, with 26 cards, it took me 3 seconds to shuffle, 15 seconds to sort. With 52 cards, it took me 3 seconds to shuffle and 35 seconds. So what we see that is crucial here is not only that it takes longer to sort than it does to shuffle, but the time it took me to shuffle 26 cards was the same as the time it took me to shuffle 52 cards. However, it took me a little over twice as long to sort 52 cards compared to sorting of the 26 cards. Now imagine that instead of 52 cards, I had a million cards. Just to give you an idea, if I had a stack of a million cards, that would reach up to about half the height of the Eiffel Tower. Now, I could still shuffle that million cards fairly easily. If they were both stacked up, I would just have to knock the two stacks into each other. But sorting them out would take an awfully long time. Now, to go back to the gas, the air in this room contains about a trillion trillion molecules. That's an awfully large number of molecules. If I had a trillion trillion cards stacked up, they would reach out to halfway to the center of our galaxy. If that's, that's a really large number of cards. If I decided to strew those cards onto the floor, I could cover the entire surface of the Earth in a two kilometer deep sea of cards. That's an awfully large number of cards. Now, technically, if I shuffled that trillion trillion, uh, no, the, if I shuffled a trillion trillion cards, it would be possible to undo the shuffle, right? The shuffle is not technically irreversible, but the amount of time that it would take to undo the shuffle is so much longer than the amount of, of time that it takes to, to do the shuffle uh, that effectively it never happens. So even though from a microscopic point of view it is possible to do the shuffle in a reversible way, in practice it never gets reversed because it would take so much time in order for the reverse, um, for the reverse process to happen. The conclusion of what we just discussed is that even though the dynamics of atoms and molecules may be reversible, it is still possible for a system that is made up of these atoms and molecules 
to behave in an irreversible way because there are so many atoms and molecules uh, in, that, uh, in that system. But what does this have to do with this, this formula, the S is equal to KB log W? Well, to discuss this, let's come back to the, the example of the sugar cube dissolving in the water and, and see how the ideas that we just discussed play out for that system. So the first question is, why is it impossible for the sugar cube to reform after it's been dissolved? Well, the point is that uh, if I start in a, in a state where the sugar is dissolved in the water, so here I represented the sugar molecules uh, kind of cartoonishly with these, these dots, if uh, these were to come together and reform a sugar cube, they would all have to do something very specific. They would all have to be moving in the right direction at the right speed in such a way that when they came together, they would naturally come at rest in a position that would look like the sugar cube, like this, this configuration over here. In order for this to happen, all of these sugar molecules have to all be doing something very specific. And since there are so many sugar molecules, again, trillions of trillions of sugar molecules, the probability that this should happen is infinitesimally small, so small that it makes no sense to even consider this as a possibility. So that's the microscopic explanation of why, the, once the sugar has been dissolved, it can't come back to its sugar cube form. But why is it that it's so difficult to get back to the sugar cube form when starting in the sugar cube form, it was so easy to dissolve. Well, the point is that if I start in this ordered uh, sugar cube form, whatever my, my sugar molecules do, so they can move in completely erratic, uh, completely random ways, whatever they do, they're going to end up looking something like uh, the dissolved state that's, that's over here. So in short, the idea is that in order to be a sugar cube, there are very few states that look like a sugar cube, whereas there are very many states that looked like dissolved sugar. In order for the sugar cube to dissolve, it has to go from this one specific sugar cube state into one of the very many dissolved states, and so the probability of that happening is fairly high. Whereas in order to get from the dissolved state into the sugar cube state, um, I have to go from a situation where there, very, there are very many possible configurations that look like the dissolved sugar and uh, bring that down into a very special configuration, that is the sugar cube state. So the irreversibility from a microscopic point of view comes from the fact that the sugar cube only corresponds to very few states, whereas the dissolved sugar corresponds to very many states. And so uh, irreversibility comes from the fact that it's easy to get from few states to many states, but not vice versa. And this is exactly what is captured by, the formula, by this formula here. This formula, incidentally, was derived by Ludwig Boltzmann. It's, uh, this S over here is called the Boltzmann entropy. The W over here measures the number of states that all look like the, the, the macroscopic state the, that you're interested in. So in the case of the sugar cube, W would measure the number of states that look like a sugar cube uh, for, for the cube, whereas for the dissolved sugar, it would look at the number of states that look like dissolved sugar. So as I mentioned, um, things are irreversible because getting from few states, the sugar cube states, to many states, the, the dissolved states, is easy, but coming back is difficult. The entropy is an increasing function of W, which means that the entropy of a state such as the sugar cube state, in which there aren't very many possibilities that look like this state, that entropy is low, whereas the entropy of the dissolved state is high because there are very many different states that look like a dissolved state. Right? So the idea that we discussed earlier that entropy is quantifying irreversibility is captured by this formula through the fact that the irreversibility comes from a microscopic point of view, from the fact that um, irreversible motions are motions that go from configurations that only work in a few states, like the sugar cube, to configurations that work in very many states, like dissolved sugar. All right, so let's summarize what we've discussed today. So we started out by talking about the fact that certain processes are irreversible. Now, incidentally, we talked about the fact that this is somewhat surprising, because if the world is made up of atoms and molecules, and atoms and molecules 
behave reversibly, how is it possible to see something irreversible? And we argued that the, the answer to that question comes from the fact that there are very many atoms and molecules, and that effectively things can still behave ir irreversibly. And next we discuss the fact that thermodynamic entropy quantifies this irreversibility. So, in other words, that thermodynamic entropy measures irreversibility. And it does that through the condition that entropy is never allowed to decrease. So if I have a state A that has a low entropy and a state B that has a higher entropy, then it's impossible for me to get from state B to state A. Quantify is irreversible. And finally, we discussed uh, the, the formula due to Ludwig Boltzmann, S is equal to KB log W, and we checked that, indeed, it satisfies the same principle as thermodynamic entropy, uh, namely that it quantifies irreversibility. Well, thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you again next time. Mm -hmm.